sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night. I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. My dad had a record player and I would uh, play his records. Uh, and it was, well, I mean, like the first music memory was just flipping through the covers of them, really, and staring at the covers of them. Um, yeah, and then just sort of listening to those, listening to those records and how silly they seemed to me. How like uh, how funny it was that people recorded themselves singing those songs, <laughs> folk songs, and uh, just sort of laughing about them, really, in a, in a way, you know. What 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 type of artists, like folk artists, would you would you listen to like, initially? Well, his big he loved um, Paul Simon, and he loved Donovan Leach. He loved Don. That's who I'm named after. Is the the the. I guess he's Irish, right? The Irish singer-songwriter Donovan Leach. And this one in particular that he had, he had this this album called Cosmic Wheels by Donovan, which had a lot of like jokey songs on it. And we listened to those and sort of giggled together. And then also we, 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 we felt like that Simon and Garfunkel was really funny, like Cecilia and these types of songs. My sister yeah. and I yeah. thought they were really, really silly and funny. You know, and me and Julio down by the schoolyard, Kodachrome, these types of songs were like, they were really lighthearted and it seemed almost like comedy to us in some way. Yeah, there is a wit to those songs, but it's not like where they're kind of, you know, weird out or something like literally yeah, yeah, trying right. to take a piss. Like that it's like it's still so musical and the music is enough without that wit to the lyrics. But the lyrics are brilliant. I always thought Paul Simon was quite underrated as a lyricist in a way. Not oh, underrated. I think he did well. He's rated, yeah, but yeah. like, the, because the music and the harmonies are so good, like. Yeah, melodically he's so good, but lyrically he's, he's all, I mean, he's, he's pretty much the high water mark as far as I'm concerned. But like, yeah, I know what you mean. And, but the, but you, when you start to like understand his influences, like doo-wop music and, and uh, you know, the things that he was obsessed with when he was a kid, you start to understand like that he's really just trying to do his own version of those of those things he's really trying to do his own version of black music that he grew up loving mm. and failing over and over again but failing in the most wonderful you know way that created its own thing anyway but yeah like we we thought those things were really fun and lighthearted. i remember my first music memories were that music was silly and a fun thing to fun thing to do that's yeah very interesting i've never heard it put like that as well uh, <laughs> and, and um as a side note as well, so you're talking there about like Paul Simon and his influences, stuff like doo-wop, or I guess the most original types of pop music. Uh, and it's definitely something that gets discussed a fair amount. Like, oh, these days all the songs are sampled, but then the 70s guys were ripping stuff off quite a lot uh, from the 50s people. Who, in your opinion, would be the original like innovators that who were the people who weren't ripping anything off in pop music terms i mean i i guess like i guess the the smart money would be on the blues singers that influenced the the the, the beatles and the rolling stones i guess the answer is muddy waters and and those people who buddy guy and those those blues singers and uh james brown who who the, the 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 white people innovators who took black music and and stole it in, in essence stole a lot of its essence in in many ways and made it um, into what we think of as pop music. I think it's probably that. I mean, I think it's 
and then I think I mean there is I mean don't you hear when you hear Motown like can you almost like you almost can't believe Motown when you hear it it must be innovative it must be like there must uh, you know there are things that the Beatles do of course that you're floored by and that was innovative and you know you know people say they wrote the language of pop music in a way but I mean you know and then when you go and talk to Paul he just says well we were just trying to rip off our influences like anybody else. But there is something about Motown. I mean, in particular, like there's something about the way those beats and the way those melodies work together, where you're like, oh, this is something completely different. It must be that, right? Don't you think? Mm. Yeah, I think all of those, all of those people are very original. Um, it's like it's kind of wondering who it was who invented the the light bulb or something, you know, like in, in the sense of, because they must, even the blues guys, they must have had something to base something off. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not smart enough to know what their influences were, but, yeah. they, but, but I do think that like, um, they were, they were, they were doing versions of the songs that their parents sang to them because music at the time wasn't even recorded. You know, it was just yeah. something that was passed along and passed down. Um, and then early Bob Dylan is just him doing versions of songs that he heard from other people. And you can hear those, you know, he's stealing the melodies of traditional folk songs and putting new words in. Yeah. I mean, the whole, the history of music is the history of theft and then it's an influence. And then it's like, uh, convoluted by white supremacy of course because so much of so much of those the work that was done by uh, black artists is 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 taken by white people and made palatable and then organized and made a lot of money up i mean you think about those blues guys going to recording studios and uh recording records and not having any any part of the master at all just like giving away their entire share of the thing because you know i mean the history of the music industry is the history of fairness for artists and i mean that's still that is still the conversation today yeah still an ongoing uh challenge i mean yeah. and where where is the line in your opinion between stealing something and being influenced by something because obviously you talk there about like the stones and the beatles stealing um and uh I mean, to a certain extent, that's got to be that's got to be true. D uh, did th did those guys um, give you know artists whose work they were influenced by or whatever enough credit? And I mean, I'm not even sure. Did did some of the original blues artists did they ever achieve the sort of success and financial remuneration that they they should have? I wonder. I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know the answer to that. But I do think that like there is such an interesting conversation about theft or in versus influence you know i don't think there there isn't very many you know instances of the rolling stones or the beatles where you can say oh they ripped someone off i think all i mean is that like they moved that music into a lane that, that uh where they could profit greatly from it uh, whereas the people who originated and made that music uh didn't have the legitimacy of the agency yet because of racism to be able to profit off it you know that's that's more the the, the conversation of those artists mm -hmm. um and like i think like there's always there's off there's really a conversation in hip-hop too always about the innovators of rap not getting enough credit and not being uh rightly compensated for their work which has been sampled and ripped off you know a million times you know um with the 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 most you know grandmaster flash and the cold crush crew or whatever there is the original conversation about that that's a conversation that exists in the hip-hop world entirely and then of course there's like that new conversation about like ed sheeran being sued by marvin gaye's family whether whether those melodies are too alike you know i think that is like a very slippery weird slope i don't know the answer to those things and i i definitely don't want a, a judge to decide a legal framework to decide those things that's the dangerous slope and also like we're hitting like a hundred years of pop music or thereabouts you know not quite 75 years of it yeah and like of course we're starting to overlap slightly like I, we've never been in this we've never had seven years of pop music there's only eight notes you know what i mean like of course we <laughs> particularly with what we've been saying you know yeah. discussion of like yeah everybody is ultimately the sum of their influences 
and as you, you know, only eight notes, so it's sort of, I mean, it is bound to happen, isn't it? Yeah, and I don't think we've ever been in this position. It's like when everybody keeps going, why do, you, why do so many celebrities keep dying? But like, we just hit the 100 mark, 100 year mark of celebrity even existing. So they're all very old. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just, practically, that's why it seems like a lot of celebrities die. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. And I guess, I mean, music is going to change when a lot of the greats, um, you know, sadly continue to pass on. It's going to be really odd because a lot of like festival headliners and things like that, a lot of big names playing arenas, stadiums, they're pretty old now. There aren't yeah. that many like big, you know, younger people doing doing that sort of thing. So I've, it is uh, true. It is funny when you see those festival lines come out and like the Who is still at the top of them, and you go, like, <laughs> "Wow, that's they." You know, that is true. There will be a gap, probably. You're right. Yeah. Um. But so, so you've you had those kind of influences. When did you start writing your own songs? I did it like as a kid. We had like a sort of. Uh, I was really into R and B and hip hop when I was a kid. I grew up where all the radio stations were, Detroit radio stations um just across the border from michigan at the right at the bottom of canada and so all the stations that we listened to were r&b stations where it was like bell bib devoe and another bad creation these types of r&b guys that were sort of straddling rap and r&b bobby brown so the first things that i wrote with my sister and i had a band <laughs> that we performed concerts with and uh not in any legitimate way but we wrote songs when we were like seven or eight you know um always always wrote songs and then like when i started to do it in a way that felt legitimized i guess that was probably 14 14 or 15 when i did it with a guitar for the first time and how did you learn to play the guitar i took lessons from a, a local guy and I, I i would i think maybe i never really learned and maybe i still don't know how to play it i'm a, i've really i'm really sometimes hit a wall in my guitar playing and you sort of I mean, any guitar person will tell you, or instruments will tell you that there's like plateaus and you feel like you're stuck at those plateaus for years. And and now I'm just, uh, I feel like I'm, uh, I have kids. It's hard for me to sit down and just noodle on the guitar like I used to when I was in my 20s. Um, but, you know, like uh, I learned, I took lessons from a guy who lived locally. I, I, and I, my memory of it is that I took like a lot of lessons and when I, circled back with my mom she was like you took maybe eight lessons and I was like oh well, that's why I'm not that good I guess <laughs> and he taught me just the chords you know the basic chords and then I would bring songs in that I wanted to play and he would teach me how to play those songs and did, uh, you, did you learn to read or did you learn learn chords and like playing by ear or, or a bit of both just playing by ear I had like some knowledge that he gave me some knowledge of looking at the music and understanding it to a certain degree but not really. I learned music later um, in high school when I took, uh, I played the clarinet in the band in high school. I learned music in that. And I have like a rudimentary knowledge enough to get through and look at a piece and figure it out. But uh, I'm much slower than I'd like to be. And when, so, so you started writing songs like pretty young. Yeah. Uh, so was there a kind of turning point where you decided like that your devotion to music was such that you wanted to pursue it? professionally and do it for the rest of your life yeah no i mean not really i think it, it was like i i wrote them all along from when i was 14 all the way until i was in my 20s I, when i got out of university i had been writing songs that whole time and i would share them with like small amounts of people i, I, I wasn't like and I had a, I had like a Tascam four track that recorded on tape cassettes, this thing that everybody who's my age had, because it was like $300 and you could do four tracks on this task and then you could ping them and do more tracks. It, and it never really sounded the way you wanted it to sound, but you could record. And I made recordings when I was in my teen years. And, uh, but you know, I, I was never really, I had taste, I guess. So I was never, I never really thought they were any good. And then when I got out of university, I had moved to the city, to Toronto, and I was acting in commercials. I took theater in university. And I was realizing that I did not like doing that uh, in, any, in any way, acting. And I started, I, I picked up the guitar again and wrote songs. And the songs that I wrote, then I go, oh, I thought, oh, these are okay. These are good enough to show people. And then I started to, to, to play shows. But not until I was 20. 
I guess 20 and 21 is when it would have started, right? When I would have started writing songs that I thought were, were good enough, you know? And so with, so was that um, for the hold up? Were, were those the songs? Yeah, that those, those are, yeah, those original songs would have been the, those first. Uh, yeah, like the first thing, there's a song on the hold up called Virginia Firm. That was probably the first song I wrote that I thought, this is good enough to show somebody. I showed the person it was about, and she was like, this is good. She listened, you know, I mean, she listened to it on her own volition, you know, I didn't have to force her. She listened to it, uh, you know, got into it and liked it. So I thought, oh, maybe this is, maybe these are okay. And it's, and you were playing gigs around this time already as well? Yeah, I was playing like open mic gigs in a uh, place, uh, you know, bars in Toronto, this place called The Central, where you could just get a show and with a whole bunch of other people and it was horrible and uh, oh. <laughs> it sounded, it sounded horrible. Uh, but it was like a way to to sort of test that out and figure out how to do that well, you know. And and what was the experience of being in a recording studio for the first time like? Oh, so fun! I mean, we I had a the the, the guy I recorded that record with. Well, the whole it would have been all me, but the together we he and I recorded the songs for the next one called "Don't Get Too Grand." Um, in a studio that uh, uh, a friend of mine worked in as a intern and he would sleep there and we would work in the night like from two until five in the morning I won't say his name because maybe he'd still get in trouble for this so we would, we would he would he would have like a late session and then he'd say to the guys who were in the studio I'm just gonna sleep here because I gotta be back here you know, 7 a.m. anyway to get set up for a 9 a.m. session. So he would sleep on the couch and then I would come in the middle of the night and maybe record from like, you know, midnight until three or four until we could stand it. We'd sleep and I would leave before the rest of the recordings. So that whole record was sort of like uh, stolen slightly, you know, snuck, we snuck it in when we could. But it was fun. I mean, it was, I didn't know, I had no idea what I was doing. I had really no idea what I was doing. I think that, and you know, everybody is sort of searching back for the joy of that the joy of being like what do we do on this and you'd be like well let me just sit down at the piano and see what i sounds good if i touch certain keys and the, we were just it was very free and i had no idea what i was doing yeah yeah i, I well it d- doesn't sound like that to me <laughs> uh i guess you know it seems seems like you're very humble about about your um, ability to write songs um and and would you say that because you mentioned don't get too grand there was that like a turning point for you would you say yeah like that one when we finished that one i guess there would have been some songs i have to look at the track list there would be some songs on the hold up that we recorded in the studio as well yeah that's right there would be there's four or five that we recorded in that same studio on on the hold up and then don't get too grand was all done in the studio but that one for sure was like there was a song in that that got um, things started to get uh, placed on television shows, on Canadian television shows, and then one of those songs went on the radio in Canada, on like the CBC, uh, you know, the equivalent of the BBC in uh, in uh, Canada, and got played across the country. And then I and then uh, it got nominated for a Juno Award, which is the Canadian Music Award, um, and that was the, that got me all the stuff that I needed to get going and got me like an agent and a manager and such yeah yeah so it was sort of the big first thing that made me see made me feel like maybe i could actually do it how did live performances change around then for you well uh i mean they were the same basically then i think like when the once the song was on the radio people would come which was amazing you know i think i played for like 140 people and in toronto we put like a show on sale and people bought tickets which was sort of Toward me and that, yeah so it was uh and it was in the basement of this hotel called the drake hotel where they had like it doesn't have anything to do with drake even though that's just a popular word in toronto i guess <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah and we sold 150 tickets and then I, I i toured opening for some people and we would get like i would get like 40 or 50 people who were there just to see me and uh yeah that was really exciting because it was you know, the whole other side of the country, people would show up and I, it felt like something, uh, it felt like it wasn't like, like people were, there was an audience and people were listening to it. You know, it was really exciting. Yeah. And, and I mean, I guess the, the next record that you released, uh, Hard Settle Ain't Troubled, uh, that yeah. must have even taken it 
I mean, quite a huge step further because obviously it included Portland, Maine, which was, which is such a, a smash. Yeah, that song was sort of that song has been added into the catalog of, of that record later. Oh, right, but so it when, was when did but, that come out as a single? Was that around the same time? After after Hard Center Control, but it's the sort of the same the same time period. But yeah, like that. Uh, when Hard Settling in Trouble came out, the version of Portland, Maine, Tim McGraw had recorded it, and his version was out when that album was out. And then we put out my version after, after the album came out. So it sort of grew at the same time as that album, yeah. But that song has been obviously a big uh, access point for people for hearing the rest of the stuff, for sure. Yeah. So with, with Tim McGraw's version... Um... I mean, do you, do you prefer singing your, like singing your own songs, like to, to giving them away? I mean, probably, but. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. There's something really fun about giving them away. I don't know. Um, there's some real joy in it. I'm not sure why, but it, it uh, I mean, to me, I guess that feels like you're a real songwriter. I mean, it feels like, you know, you know, you can hear Nina Simone versions of Bob Dylan songs. Yeah, that's you know, true. You yeah. Hear, you know, like these incredible artists, or Aretha singing people's songs, you know? Um, so there's a real mythology and, and like loveliness in the idea of being a songwriter for other people that I've always been attracted to. So to me, it's like, it's really exciting to hear someone else singing. I feel like that makes you a legit songwriter when someone else wants to record one of your songs. Maybe that's a bit arrogant, but I do think that that's like... No, yeah, I think... Yeah. Especially so there's a major singer. Yeah, yeah. When it's, a, when it's someone whose voice you recognize and is, and is famous or something to it. So I, didn't, I never like... I, I knew that song was good. I thought Portland Maine was, I mean, when I wrote it, I was like, that's the best song I've ever written. I, I knew it. I knew it was. Um, it was not surprising to me in any way that people liked it. Um, and I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've written a song as good as that since, honestly. Like, I, think, I mean, it may be as good, but I don't think better. It's such a nice, easy song to hear. Uh, and I don't really understand why. But so I, it, it didn't surprise me that he liked it. It surprised me how, um, sort of honorable he was to the vibe of the song he really stuck stuck with it the way we had recorded it and it was really you know it was really nice to hear um but I, if that was just his song i would have been still really happy i, I think it's a good song what, what was so and when when you release your version so what, what was the kind of were you always going to do your version or was it meant to be for him and then you just thought you know hang on a minute this is such a good tune i'm going to release it that's yeah. basically it i always just felt like you know there was time when we thought that his version would get some attention or get, you know, you're always hoping for, like when you have a slow song like that on a famous person's album, you always think maybe we'll get the fourth single here. Maybe they'll dump this song in the fourth single and it'll get some attention. Uh, but, it, you know, that's that, that would be a real stretch for an artist like Tim, you know. Um, he has to put out really big hit songs to get people coming out of those concerts. He's got to fill up a stadium, you know what I mean? So, um, but... Uh, yeah, I think like I just loved it, and and I thought let's let's make a version and put it out. Um, and we needed stuff after that album. We didn't have I didn't have anything else recorded, and uh, the way streaming is is you have to you know you have to keep momentum going. You can't disappear like you used to. Artists used to disappear. They don't they don't seem to really go away, and, except mm -hmm. for the really cool people like Adele who goes seems to go away in a cool way. No, well, so it's, we just it's, needed. It's uh. I guess it's easier to go away if you have, I mean, it's not easy to do what Adele does because she is uh, so successful. It's unreal. But yeah. I guess when you've got that success, people are like, we want some more of that. We want some more tunes. And then that, that demand is just so high. It would be so fun to be able to go. I mean, my, my favorite artists go away in that way. I think it's a really fun way to live would be, you know, go away and emerge as a new thing every single time. But, but you, I feel like there's so much thought and obviously because you know you're a writer there's a lot that goes into making your albums so how do you find that pressure to keep up with the sort of the, the streaming market that that all musicians and singer songwriters have to live in these days uh does does that affect the way that you write i think it i th i'm i'm lucky in that i'm i sort of have two jobs where I'm always writing with other artists or, or, or with friends for other people. I'm always writing. I never, I mean, I mean, I know artists who say, oh, I'm going to a writing thing, but I never leave it. I'm always writing. 
and I have appointments for me, you know, I'm writing a song today, you know, an hour after this. So like, uh, I'm writing with the artist Matt Nathanson after this. So it's like, I'm always gathering up stuff. And so it's not, it's not crazy for me to maintain that schedule. I think like there are a lot of people for whom the, the quest to find songs is so personal that it's really hard for them to keep up with that pace. And I think it is sort of too demanding in some regards for some people. Um, and it's sort of the way that it crushes people's uh, will to be able to continue like that. So I, I do think it is interesting. I mean, I think we'll see that pace of release slow down on streaming, hopefully, but but I, I find it sort of fun. Like I find it, um, I'm interested in it. I love having new songs out. So I find it kind of fun. Although every once in a while there's a song that comes out and and it doesn't really get the reaction you want. And you think, oh, I wish we had a couple more months to focus on this song before we really before we you know obliterate it by releasing something else you know but um all in all i really like it do, do you envisage um envisage a future for music where it goes back at all and people get more time to listen to albums or do you see it going the other way where songs not in any sort of way that's like malicious by consumers but they start to become a little bit undervalued i mean i kind of think that might have already happened and it's not out of malice it's literally just like because we now live in an era where people can literally get the phone out and sing some kind of incredible vocal and upload it onto tiktok in literally like 30 seconds flat yeah. um you know like it doesn't matter if, if it's if that's two minutes and it took you know hardly any time to, to upload uh, and and something that you've spent a year working on is too yeah. long. Like, what's the difference in it for the consumer? I think that's interesting. I mean, I think that that's the, the question that we that. I mean, I think that's all a really interesting conversations. And I, I think I can't imagine us going coming back from streaming in in many ways because I have. I mean, I always watch my own kids who are very young, but I have a a, a nine year old boy who, for his entire life, he's had access to any song ever recorded at any time anywhere you know like if we're in a car he goes can i hear this and he can you know like and he's so used to that that the idea that that's not available would just be unfathomable to him i don't think people will accept it. i think like this is this is mm. where we're at i don't think it's going back but i do think the question of like i think for a lot of kids the music tiktok is interesting because it's like i mean obviously it's horrible in many ways from, from <laughs> music um and then it's also like, I, I, don't, I don't ever want to be a Luddite or a guy who's just afraid of those things. But at the same time, I do think it makes music into a strange sort of background noise. Um, that, and, and it sort of me, it sort of flattens the value of those things. And I think that's, a, that's an interesting conversation. Like you said, like, this is as meaningful as this, you know. Um, but then you look at I mean, the what was the thing that 70, 75% of all the music streamed was catalog recordings, you know, that classic song catalog recordings still beat out new releases, which means that kids are listening to uh, as much catalog music as they are because the primary users of streaming services are young. What does that mean? You know what I mean? You know, does that mean music was music was better in the olden days, like, like old people all think, you know, <laughs> it's just, um, I don't know, I think we're on the precipice of something interesting. I just have no clue what it is. No yeah. clue. What the... Yeah, I think, I think you are probably right on that because yeah, yeah that, is, that is an interesting statistic that, what, what was it? 40%. I think. No, it's like 80, I think it's, 80, I, I think it's 82% of music was cataloged. 82 per stream percent of stream music was catalog which means songs that are f at, at minimum 14 months at 14 months after their release which isn't too big but that but i mean if you go look at like i mean if you go look at acdc spotify page they got a, you know hundreds of millions of streams this, this is the label that has owned this the masters of these songs they're making a whole other income stream now off of these classic songs you know and, and there's some i mean there's something to that i mean I'm, I'm not sure what it means but the idea that you know kid i mean i don't i don't think there's any real proven artists with staying power that have been uh, brought to us through tiktok yet like i don't think anybody's moved into the realm of they're here for good from tiktok yet but we'll see maybe that will happen
Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe there are fewer artists who are kind of like ACDC or, you know, whatever, like those type of bands, like, well, like the Who or, or you know, people where you, they're so big, like Ray Charles, but you can make like a film about them or something. Like maybe there are just loads and loads of, of talented, amazing people who make great albums, but there are just so many, like it's, it's, made it more of a meritocracy in a way because anybody can release so so when something fantastic is released it gets a great review and it's very difficult to become like a superstar uh, yeah i wonder how, and, and i mean you think of somebody like phoebe bridges who who got sort of shot out of the fame can in the last two years in a way that's like saturday Night live you know she's you know doing all the biggest things that are possible for an artist her size but she's still not world famous in the way we we made people world famous in the olden days you know i mean now now her music is like part and parcel of that but nirvana was a really cult thing and their music was not in the mainstream in any way and they became globally famous so it's like is that does that just not exist anymore or what you know i don't know it's an interesting there's lots of interesting questions yeah, I think it's probably for fewer people. But one question that I, I want to ask is, you know, given the fact that we now have access to any song ever recorded at any time, um, what are some of the things that you would suggest listening to kind of more on repeat? What are the things that you could not live without or the artists that you could not live without? Well, I'm, I, I'm like, um, I'm obsessed with, I mean, in my whole life, I've been obsessed with Paul Simon. And, uh, you know, I, that's just that's sort of a high watermark of singer songwriters for me. But the other thing that, like, I, I, I've got, since streaming existed, I mean, I, I'm really excited about finding hip hop that I like that's coming out, rap that I like, uh, that I may not have found otherwise. I love, I really love Corday right now. I mean, I'm, mm. most, most of what I listen to is outside of my own genre at this point um and that's exciting to me but also like i mean the things that exist it's so fun to be able to be exposed to something like all of bill withers's catalog all of you know that you can go and dig into those things and you don't just have the greatest hits yeah um, that's so fun to be able to have those whole records i mean i i didn't have i didn't have a huge I was never, I understood John Prine and, and appreciated him as a songwriter. I didn't have like a huge knowledge of his recordings. And when he died, I knew, I knew the popular, I mean, I knew Angel of Montgomery and I knew this, these songs that, because people in Nashville, I'm in Nashville, a lot of people in Nashville are obsessed with him. But when, when he died, I was able to go and really listen to live albums, really listen to those things. God, I fell in love with it. It's such a fun time. Um, yeah, well, I listened to it. I listened to John Brown a lot more when he passed away. Yeah, it's very morbid that 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 happens. I mean, people, there's that old adage that you sell more records when when you pass on. I mean, that that kind of yeah. certainly happens to the to the bigger names. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I almost couldn't believe that I didn't really know John Prine's music once no. I was digging in there. Well, it's not. I mean, he's been a cult thing. You know, it's not really. You know, people who love him love him. And my dad was never really into him. So I just didn't, I didn't know. It was also, it's like, it's a very American thing. It's very American. And the, the sort of tongue and cheekness of it is very American. You know, it would be one of those things that like, I mean, there are Canadian things that do not seem to translate to um, the American musical language. And I'm sure there are UK things like, like what, what was the UK thing is like the Stone Roses that everybody in the UK is obsessed oh, with. Bang it. And, so. and everybody loves them. And then they they don't quite, the musical language doesn't quite translate to America in uh, some way. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the vibe, just everything about them. Yeah. Well, they, they got booked to headline Coachella like okay. four years ago or something, Stone Roses. With, <laughs> and I think like half the audience are like, who on earth are these guys? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I know them. I, I know them because. I was obsessed with Oasis and Oasis was obsessed with them. So yeah. that's, that's the reason I know them. Well, that's I, same here. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's like retracing. Cause uh, I think, you know, Liam Gallagher basically saw Ian Brown and Ian Brown does not have a 
very good voice, to be honest. Like it, it was it, it's just like it's good because it's Ian Brown, but he's just got a swagger to him. And I think Liam was just like, oh, fuck. I can do this too. Like anyone can do this. Yeah, too. Of an Adidas hoodie. Like yeah. I love love that. And it is very British. So it's interesting to say that. It was such a thrill to me to see Liam Gallagher still to this day. Like or thinking of him in like a big fucking army coat with his hands behind his back, like singing up into a microphone, holding a tambourine behind his back is like, to me, just because of, I know that's probably not cool to be a young person anymore, but the, just because of the age I was when that happened, I don't think any human being has ever been cooler than, than that guy doing that shit. It was so yeah. fucking bad. <laughs> like yeah. when, you know what I mean, came out? Like as the lead single. Oh um, yeah. That's and like and the, all the video was with like the helicopters going over. That video, like, fuck, man, that was so cool. It was so cool. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it, the fact that that was a number one single, it sounds so different to, you know, that really was trademark of, of the '90s. It's that's it's a real. I mean, I know they probably don't like the term Britpop, but it was, it was that type of thing. And, yeah. and like movies, like Lockstock, uh, that came out around then, and it's just that whole '90s um vibe uh that's that's very cool because so i mean there's a few few things uh to recommend to people there everything from bill withers to uh the stone roses but one thing that i wanted to finish off by recommending to my listeners was uh your last album without people which i thought was a masterpiece i mean that it's the it's the the deluxe version on spotify that starts off um with grew apart um and also whatever keeps you going uh, with the choir on it. Uh, the kids. And, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, but it's just the whole, the whole record um, is fantastic. And I, I wanted to know like, how, how it was made um, because obviously it would have been recorded before pandemic, right? It was kind of recorded. Well, thank, first of all, thanks, Tom. I appreciate you liking it so much. Um, the, um, yeah, it was, it was, most of it was recorded right at the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, it was, and it was all done sort of remotely. I mean, we did a lot of it remotely. Everybody's mostly set up to record in their own space. We only had one day in the studio together before. We were supposed to have a week uh, to do all the bed tracks. And we had one day and then the sort of stay at home order happened in Canada where we all had to stay home. And uh, we're in Canada, we all obey that stuff. <laughs> so we did stay home. And uh, and then it was all made remotely after that, you know. Um, yeah, which is a really strange way to make a record. And then it came out in the pandemic. And I don't, I don't know that it really got... I feel like it got a little bit of a short shrift or, or it didn't get paid attention to in Canada uh, in the way my other records did, I think because of the pandemic. Or maybe like it's just that people didn't like it as much as the other one. But the streaming numbers seem to show that people like it. But it, it just didn't yeah. get much attention. Didn't get much attention when it came out. Um, and, but it was a fun record to make. And I had a lot, a lot of the songs I had written before the pandemic. Uh, there's only one that I wrote in it. I can't remember which one. Oh, I wrote Man Made Lake uh, in the pandemic. But other than that, they were all written before then. Um, yeah. And what do written. you have coming up this year? I have an EP coming out on March uh, 18th, uh, which is just five, uh, five songs, five song EP coming out called Big Hurt Boy. Um, and the first another song well, the first song is out already it's called i hope you change your mind yeah. and there's another single coming out on wednesday which is called i will mention it again and this is kind of like we had enough songs to make another record right off the bat and sort of with the singles that came out before this and this is kind of like a record in, in its own way but i love eps i've always loved eps yeah i love since i mean i think my generation got obsessed with them because of radiohead's airbag ep which everybody was so <laughs> obsessed with because it was so rad um so i have like a real i love them I, I would do them only those if i could but you sort of have to still have albums because of the way press works and stuff but yeah i yeah. love EPs, eps are brilliant and i mean there are no rules anymore uh, and people release i mean in hip-hop people release like what seem like albums to me and they're like no it's a mixtape but i just yeah. oh, but it's great like why is it not an album it's got more songs than most albums have on it yeah 
but you know i mean there there are no rules anymore but eps are something that's like old but still works so well during the streaming yeah i love it i love i love a five song series that you can sort of uh, have a tight focus of what those are about and uh or also what they're trying to get at in a good way it's really it's really nice to me yeah and i hope you change your mind is is out already um yeah. and yeah so alongside um going back to um without people which as i say i thought was absolutely brilliant um i'd rec recommend um my listeners checking that out so donovan thank you so much for coming on the show it was really awesome talking to you and uh get sidetracked a few times on uh, some of my favorite artists <laughs> oh, man. well thank you thanks for thanks for having me and thanks for all the nice thoughtful questions i appreciate it